Distinguished uh, participant, I wish you a very good morning or uh, afternoon from wherever you are joining us today. My name is uh, Safia Tualzumanu and I'm director of the Independent Delivery Unit of the Africa Renewable Energy Initiative, which is an Africa-led and Africa-owned initiative hosted by the African Development Bank. It is with great pleasure that I would like to welcome you all to this virtual webinar on renewable, renewable energy as a key element of post-COVID recovery in Sub-Saharan Africa, which is organized as a side event to the 2021 UN High-Level Political Forum. I'm most pleased to moderate this important meeting. Taking this opportunity, I would like to extend my very warm welcome to all the participants here today, especially our high-level participants from IRENA and the, the co-sponsors. Precisely, Mr. Francesco La Camera, Director General of IRENA, Her Excellency Dr. Nawal El Hosseini, Permanent Representative of the United Arab Emirates to IRENA, Mr. Stefano Signori, Head of Unit at the Direct Director General for International Partnership at the European Union Commission, and His Excellency Martin Bill Hermann, Permanent Representative of the Kingdom of Denmark to the United Nations. I would also like to greet all participants from government counterparts, financial institutions, development partners, private sector, and non-governmental organizations who have joined us today. We are really excited to see such a high interest from a broad set of audience from all over the world. So distinguished participants, allow me to give you some logistical information regarding today's meeting. As we are you are aware the event is conducted virtually. If you encounter any technical issues, please write your issue in the chat box and someone from the organizing team will help you. Please note that we have a simultaneous interpretation in French and English, and the channels can be selected in your Zoom settings. For all panelists, we would request you to please unmute yourself and start your video while making an intervention. Likewise, pleasure ensure that, please ensure that uh, mutes yourself when not speaking, just to avoid any background noise. A recording of the webinar will be made available on the IRENA website after the meeting. Today's meeting will shortly start with a welcoming remark from the IRENA Director General and the co-sponsor, followed by the representative of the co-sponsor. After we'll have a moderator discussion feature high-level experts from key countries and regional organization of the Sub-Saharan African region. We are hopeful that today's event, which brings together a rich set of high-level representatives and experts active on the energy transition in the African context, will allow all of us to reflect and agree on the role of the energy transition in Africa's response to the current crisis and beyond in order to achieve sustainable development and uh, climate objectives. So without any further delay, to begin with today's program, it's my pleasure to invite the Director General of IRENA, Mr. Francesco La Camera, who will be delivering his welcoming remark. Thank you, thank you, dear Secretary. Excellencies, English participants, ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to welcome you all at this event. Let me also extend a warm welcome to our co-sponsor, Denmark, the European Commission, and the United Arab Emirates, as well as to our distinguished speakers who are joining us today. Over a year since it began, the COVID-19 pandemic continues to impact our health, livelihoods, and economy today. What we have learned in the past month is a hard lesson, but an important one. We cannot continue to consider energy in silos. As we recover from the pandemic, we have an opportunity to address several social, economic, and climate priorities at once by prioritizing the energy transition. Last June, we had a clear message from African leaders, development partners, and other stakeholders during the high level dialogue which ARENA co organized with the African Union. 
it was a call for action to shape Africans' response to the crisis by aligning national and regional recovery efforts with the medium and long-term objectives of the SDGs, Agenda 2063, and the Paris Agreement. Sub-Saharan countries already face severe challenges towards achieving their SDG 7 objectives, which is exacerbated further by the pandemic. Today, only around 46% of Africa have access to electricity services. This is simply unacceptable, given that we have the technological solutions available to tackle this issue. As we transform the continent's energy system, we must ensure prosperity for all Africans, having everyone on board, enjoying the benefit of the new system. As Africa continues its rapid economic development, renewable energy can be a game changer. It can provide timely access to clean electricity that protects health and the environment, and do so while creating millions of new jobs, stimulating industrial development along the value chains, and shaping a different future for Africa's youth. It can provide a foundation for resilient economies and society as the effect of climate change intensifies. Still, renewables uptake remain slow in the, content, in the continent. For instance, while the global renewable power capacity addition in 2020 was 260 gigawatts, only 2.6 gigawatts of this was in Africa. And this is really a we cannot allow having a dual track for energy transition where some countries rapidly turn green and other remain trapped in the fossil fuel based system of the past. The transition is not just a fuel replacement, but a creation of a new system. Last month, we released our World Energy Transition Outlook, showing how the energy transformation we need to align with the 1.5 degree trajectory. ARENA considers electrification and energy efficiency to be the main decarbonization drivers, enabled by renewables and complemented by green hydrogen and sustainable biomass. And these technologies can shape the avenue to lead, out us, of the, uh, lead us out of the crisis towards a clean energy system. The outlook provides the technology, policy and investment elements for a different energy future. We will translate this global vision into regional outlooks and framework for investment to show what is possible. Through long-standing partnership with stakeholders at the continental, continental, regional and national levels, we remain committed to work closely with African countries and realize this vision. I hope today's event will stimulate a lively discussion on the role of renewable in accelerating Africa energy transformation in the context of the post-COVID recovery and identify concrete action that we can take forward and implement on the ground. I thank you and wish a very successful event. Back to you, Secretary. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Erina uh, uh, Digi, for those inspiring words. It's always very encouraging to have your constant support and guidance to deepen Irina's engagement in Sub-Saharan Africa. It's now my pleasure to give the floor to Her Excellency Dr. Nawal El Hosseini, permanent representative of the United Arab Emirates to Irina. The floor is yours, Excellency. Thank you. Thank you, Safi. Thank you so much. And thank you, Francesco, for uh, this inspirational words. Uh, our co-hosts, speakers, and participants, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are. Thank you, everybody, for being with us. 
Uh, it is a true pleasure to join such a distinguished gathering on renewable energy as a key element and driver of post-COVID recovery and future development. Recent reports provided by IRENA have shown that the success story of the cost decline for renewables continue and that the pandemic has not uh, impacted. Uh, we witnessed an increase of capacity uh, of renewable energy in the last year by 10.3% to 2,799 gigawatt globally. This is an addition of 261 gigawatt. However, this development has not so far reached the African continent and very specifically to sub-Saharan Africa, as, as uh, we heard from uh, Francesco. So despite the fact that sub-Saharan Africa has an abundance of renewable energy sources, we still see the majority of people without uh, energy access in this region. The latest report on tracking SDG 7, which was developed by IRENA and other partners in the energy space, sadly showed that still 759 million people lack access to energy. In Sub-Saharan Africa alone, the access rate was 46% in 2019 and 517 million people still did not have access to electricity. The pandemic has negatively impacted people's health, economy, and the very fragile energy system. So we see that the only viable response that can address those three aspects in, of, disrupt, of disruption at the same time is harnessing the full power of renewable energy. The United Arab, Arab Emirates has long supported renewable energy through projects carried out by its flagship uh, energy company, Mostar, and the Abu Dhabi Fund for Development. It has been a major partner in Africa's energy transition with over two, uh, 25 existing and under development renewable, uh, renewables projects, providing a combined capacity of one gigawatt in 14 African countries, including sub-Saharan countries. So in addition, uh, Mostar has installed close to 27,000 solar home systems and rural villages in the continent that have changed the lives of so many people. And our Zaid Sustainability Prize has driven innovation and sustainability and renewable energy in Africa through supporting enterprises and schools that truly left their mark, uh, left their mark on their communities. We are also very proud to mention that just a few weeks ago, the, actually three weeks ago, the Mohammed bin Zayed solar complex was inaugurated in Togo. The plant is part of the ADFD IRENA, ADFD, which is Abu Dhabi Fund for Development, IRENA project facility funded by the uh, Abu Dhabi Fund for Development and implemented by the UAE based solar project developer EMEA. This uh, project, which is 50 megawatt solar PV plant, provide electricity to thousands of homes and small businesses and will contribute greatly to the Togolese commitment to establish a universal access to electricity and increase the share of renewables. We are proud to be part of this success story, which not only opens opportunities for local businesses and creates jobs, but also shows us what can be achieved with the right mindset and like-minded partners. Finance does play a very important role in a sustainable energy transition, but trust in partners, knowledge, and the right project foundation policy framework is very, very critical. The UAE has been actively engaged, uh, engaged as a global theme champion for the high-level dialogue on energy for enabling SDGs through an inclusive, just energy transition. We continue to do so by developing national energy compacts and also looking with partners into international compacts, bringing energy and clean cooking to people and communities. Our efforts towards providing energy for development enables us not only to achieve SDG, SDG 7, but also many other sustainability goals, such as gender equality, education, and health, and many others. Thank you very much. Back to you, Safiata. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Noel, for your address and uh, for highlighting the key role of the EU government in the support of uh, renewable energy as key driver in the post-COVID recovery in uh, Africa. I fully agree with you that with the right mindset, I mean, we can achieve a lot. So I would like now to pass the floor to Mr. Stefano Signore from the European Union Commission for his uh, statement. 
Thank you, Safiato, and uh, good morning, afternoon, everybody. Happy to join this uh, side event today. With the COVID-19 pandemic, which has hit the world very, very hard, and as we seek to recover from the crisis, we must take the opportunity to build uh, back better, as Francesco was saying. For the energy sector, it means we need to accelerate the energy access, but at the same time, also the global transition towards renewable and low carbon energy systems. In the European Union, we are pursuing the Green Deal as our economic growth strategy, and since the COVID pandemic, also our recovery strategy. The Green Deal is a transformative and inclusive agenda combining policies with investments. Renewable energy and technologies are at the heart of this transformation, and to bring it about, we will intensify our engagement with partner countries and with all relevant stakeholders. In many countries with energy access challenges, we see the opportunity to leapfrog towards renewable energy sources. If we look at Africa in particular, the continent is facing a paradox. It is one of the world's richest regions in the world in renewable energy sources, but still close to 600 million people do not have access to electricity and some 850 million still lack access to clean cooking. For us, the partnership with Africa in the energy sector is and will remain a priority. For the last financing period between 2014 and 2020, we have mobilized some 3 billion euros of funds for sustainable energy cooperation in the continent. And we have focused efforts on three drivers, promoting political ownership and partnerships, improving governance and reforms in the energy sector, and boosting investment through innovative financial instruments and the risking tools. The investment in the energy sector supported by the European Union have a large scalability and replicability potential. However, this is not enough to bridge the gap for energy access in Africa. We have understood that the approach should be reinforced by increasing the leverage of EU funding under our new multi-annual budget that runs between 2021 and 2027, we intend to take a stronger approach to address today's challenges. Therefore, we are raising our climate ambition by allocating 30% of available funding to climate action, up from the previous 20%. And investment in renewable energy will play an important role in this framework. Let's also admit that donors funding alone is not sufficient to respond to the investment needs in energy infrastructure. Universal access and green transition will not be achieved without unlocking and scaling up dramatically private financing. ODA uh, resources can only be the oil that lubricates the engine. It is needed, but not sufficient on its own. It should be used as a catalyst to leverage relevant policies and mobilize private funds. Multilateral development banks will play a crucial role in structuring operations that help mobilize private funding for such renewable energy projects. Let me stress that we see Africa as a clear priority for accelerating access to sustainable energy. And we want to enter a new phase of this partnership by proposing an Africa EU Green Energy Initiative that could be launched in the near future. Across the world, renewable energy is becoming the most cost-effective option to generate electricity and address the needs of a rapidly growing population. And we believe Africa can become a major global market for renewable energy. For instance, we are supporting the African Union Commission in its work to build an African single electricity market. We are also working together with the African Union Union Development Agency and IRENA on the development of the Continental Transition uh, System Master Plan. Let me conclude by saying that technology solutions are abundant and ready to be deployed, and development cooperation funds will play an important role in leveraging private sector investment in clean energy. We can address the risks while making the best of the opportunities by acting together promoting more partnership for a green transition that benefits us all from the environmental, social, and economic point of view. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Stefano, for your statement and uh, insight, which clearly underpins the important role of uh, European Union 
uh, in the long-term sustainable development in Africa. From my side as an actor, I mean, as a person who is leading the technical work of the Africa Renewable Energy, I can testify the great support of uh, European Union to the renewable energy sector in Africa. I would now like to invite His Excellency, Mr. Martin Bill Herman, permanent representative of the Kingdom of Denmark to the United Nations for his opening uh, statement. I understand that uh, Mr. Herman is not with us, so we would look to invite him for his statement as at a later stage. So this, uh, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished participant, the next item of the agenda will be an overview presentation of IRENA's engagement at national, regional, and uh, continental level in uh, Africa. So for that, I'm pleased to welcome Mr. Binu Parton, head of regions at IRENA. Binu, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Safi. Uh, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, good morning, good afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure for us to present an uh, overview of IRENA's work in this important region uh, in Africa. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? So the agency has been active in the continent uh, since its inception, the last 10 years or so. And some of our work uh, since the beginning and now has focused on the power sector, uh, starting with the Eastern Africa and the Southern Africa, the Africa Clean Energy Corridor, which uh, uh, has extended to the, uh, the West African region uh, with the West African Clean Energy Corridor. We also have uh, in the North African region, the Pan-Arab Clean Energy uh, Initiative with the League of Arab States, which cover the Maghreb countries. And uh, in Central Africa, the region roadmap uh, on renewable energy. Uh, one of the features of this cooperation that we had is that uh, along with the strong technical engagement with the government and member countries in the region. We've also had uh, significant high level political support. Uh, for instance, the Africa Clean Energy Corridor was supported by the energy ministers and the WACAC, the West African Clean Energy Corridor was actually supported by the heads of states level. And we've recently in the last one month uh, uh, supported the validation and approval of the Regional Renewable Energy Roadmap for Central Africa, which we expect that will be endorsed by the heads of states in the coming months by the end of this year. So this is a testament to the importance uh, uh, and collaboration that IRINA has with uh, our member countries in Africa. Next slide, please. Apart from the continental level, we've also been very focused at the region and the country level. And one uh, aspect which is highlighted in several interventions earlier was the role of and the importance of energy access. So we do have uh, initiatives looking at energy access, trying to mainstream renewable energy into access programs uh, across the continent. We've also increasingly uh, been working with uh, WHO, World Bank and the Sustainable Energy for All on uh, bring, bringing attention to an important uh, nexus between energy and health. Uh, under the Health Energy uh, uh, Platform for Action, HEPA, and there will be a report which will be published. Another important aspect is entrepreneurship, uh, enterprises which are uh, developed and run by Africans providing renewable energy for African countries. We've had a successful initiative in West Africa where a large number of entrepreneurs were supported on their business models, they were mentored to start energy enterprises providing renewable energy and energy access in West Africa. We are now replicating that uh, experience in uh, Southern Africa uh, with the SADC uh, region as well. So these are some of the elements that characterized our uh, uh, work in the uh, continent. Next slide, please. But however, the flagship uh, effort on our side uh, remains as the renewable readiness assessments. We have completed 10 renewable readiness assessments with African member countries, and uh, two are underway in uh, uh, Botswana and Burkina Faso, and one in the planning stages in Chad. Uh, this is an important tool of IRENA, which is led by the countries with broad-based stakeholder engagement and country ownership, where we bring in our analytical uh, understanding expertise to work with the country to identify a set of actions which will uh, 
accelerate the renewable energy development and move us towards energy transition. So at the end of this process, we identify a number of actions in, for example, policy, regulation, finance, business models, uh, et cetera, which will take uh, renewable energy forward in the country and support energy transition and climate action. And we are increasingly focusing our efforts on post uh, uh, RRA implementation. And one of the aspects that we are emphasizing a bit more in the continent is deep dive on uh, energy transition financing. And this is something that we are piloting now in Burkina Faso. Next slide, please. Over the last uh, one year plus, uh, we've seen this opportunity offered by the COP26 or the UNFCCC, where uh, countries were considering uh, updated NDCs. And so we brought the whole range of skills uh, with the, at the disposal of the agency to support uh, member countries, over 70 of them, covering 3 billion tons of CO2 equivalent globally, uh, to work with them using our support packages to uh, increase the renewable energy ambition uh, in their uh, planned NDC submissions. And wherever NDCs have been submitted, to work with those countries to accelerate the implementation of those NDC commitments. So Africa, again, has been a major focus of our efforts. We are working with uh, uh, 22 countries in Africa, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa plus North Africa. And uh, uh, this is a, an effort which will continue beyond the NDC submissions into NDC implementation, and hopefully will gravitate towards the long-term strategies uh, of uh, mid-century carbon neutrality, uh, net zero by 2050 as well. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a, a kind of an overview of uh, the countries that we have worked uh, with in Africa. And just to highlight some of the, and what you see in the middle of the slide are the, the various uh, uh, classes of activities that we support. Some of the key ones is really working with uh, uh, countries to ensure that the energy data and the monitoring, reporting and verification systems are robust and institutions are, uh, uh, have the strength to ensure that the renewable energy uh, achievements are actually uh, documented properly and uh, uh, there is a clear uh, system for recording these uh, as well as monitoring and reporting under the UNFCCC and the various energy and SDG commitments. Another important uh, uh, work that we've been doing is really looking at the long term on energy sector planning and then trying to bring in renewable energy and we, we believe that if you take a longer term perspective, uh, renewables do become the most uh, uh, attractive option in Africa and elsewhere. And one of the cost reports that we published recently demonstrated very clearly that renewable energy is uh, the cheapest uh, power sector option in most uh, countries around the world, including in Africa, compared to the cheapest of the fossil fuel option. What we also found is that uh, renewable energy actually is cheaper uh, as a new option compared to existing uh, fossil fuel power plants. Uh, so what that means is that it might actually be better to bring on board uh, uh, new renewable energy rather than continuing to operate some of the existing power plants. So these are important signals for the policymakers in Africa and beyond. And we are working together with our member countries in the region uh, to, uh, uh, to reflect some of these uh, analytical findings that we have in the policies and programs of uh, countries in the region. Next slide, please. Uh, there's also uh, an important aspect at the, uh, the continental, the region and national level is the development of master plans and also the master plan and long-term planning. So we have uh, done, for example, a must, uh, master plan development in the energy sector with Eswatini in Southern Africa. We've been doing uh, a number of capacity building initiatives in West Africa and also in Central Africa. And then more recently, we are working with the AUDA African Union Development Agency, NIPAD, on a continental power system master plan, uh, which will be sure that with uh, a, a Africa, Pan-Africa power sector master plan will help in increasing the, the role of renewables and they will provide uh, Africa with a, a strong basis to to electrify some of the end users and in some sense leapfrog uh, uh, the need to go through the 
the more uh, uh, le less cleaner options for induced electrification, uh, induced uh, energy. Next slide, please. One of the important reports, uh, flagship report Irina has is the World Energy Transitions Outlook, uh, which clearly showed a few weeks uh, earlier that there is a clear uh, pathway uh, to achieving the 1.5 degree goal of the Paris Agreement. And that uh, achieving that goal is really viable with the current available technologies. And we see that electrification uh, is going to be a major trend. A lot of that electricity coming from renewable energy, but also there are opportunities for uh, options such as uh, green hydrogen to decarbonize some of the difficult sectors to decarbonize like uh, long-term transport or industry, et cetera. As was alluded to the Director General of IRENA, uh, the, all of these require investments and uh, the investments that have been directed towards Africa has been really small, almost uh, uh, amounting to about a one percentage or so. This needs to change and there can be more investments in Africa, primarily from the private sector and of course leveraged by the government sector and supported. And this is an important priority for IRENA as well. And towards this end, what we have tried to do, next slide please, is to create a, an initiative, a new division, which does look at uh, uh, project facilitation and support. And as uh, Her Excellency Nawal Hassani alluded to, there was a recent project supported by the ADFT in Togo, which is an example of what these uh, efforts can do. So what we have established is a climate investment platform in collaboration with UNDP and SE for All and in cooperation with the Green Climate Fund, which will uh, identify projects uh, all over the world. But uh, we see that a strong pipeline in the CIPs from Africa, where we do support these projects to reach bankability. And then uh, several other partners in the CIP, which number over 200, can actually support these projects. Along with the CIP, what we have plans for is to organize a series of investment forums, the centerpiece of which will be matchmaking of bankable projects with the financiers in renewable energy. And uh, at the same time, we also want to have a dialogue uh, between the project developers and the governments to create an enabling conditions for renewable energy investments in the countries. And also we want to ensure that uh, our capacity building uh, programs and efforts in the energy sector and renewable energy are organized at the sub-region level alongside this effort. So we do hope that uh, uh, the situation will improve and it will allow us to meet in a physical setting. And we hope to start these investments forums in Africa, hopefully in the early part of next year. Uh, next slide, please. So that's an uh, overview of our work uh, in the region. And we just wanted to underline again that Africa remains a key priority for IRENA. We will continue to increase our work uh, supporting African con member countries in their energy transition and climate action. And increasingly, we'll see IRENA playing a more active role in project facilitation and support in this region. So all of us at IRENA stand ready to work uh, strongly with uh, our member countries in African region and look forward to discussing more opportunities how we can partner with Africa in this energy transition and uh, supporting climate action. Thank you very much and back to you, Safi. Thank you very much, uh, Binu, for this very comprehensive uh, presentation, which uh, shed light to a great uh, I mean, extent on the agency's engagement with the relevant stakeholders across uh, the continent. I would like to check again whether uh, His Excellency Martin Bill Herman, permanent representative of the Kingdom of Denmark to the United Nations is with us. If yes, you may have the floor, sir. We understand that uh, Mr. Herman is uh, not with us. So moving uh, with the program, the next item on the agenda is the moderated discussion. So for that, I'm pleased to welcome uh, the panelists. The first one is uh, Mr. Michael Ahimbisigwe, the Principal Energy Officer at the Ministry of Energy and uh, Mineral Development of uh, Uganda. So Mr. Ahimbisigwe is a Senior Officer from the Ministry. He brings in rich experience in promoting sustainable energy in Uganda and East Africa. Some of his previous assignments include 
formulating regional strategy for scaling up access to modern energy, developing an energy security policy framework for the East Africa region, as well as he's a focal point for Irene activities in Uganda. He was also focal point for Janda at the Energy Resources Directorate, amongst others. He also served as acting executive director for the East African Community Center for Excellence for Renewable Energy and uh, Energy Efficiency between 2016 and uh, 2018. Before uh, handing the floor to Michael, I would just like to highlight the fact that each panelist has prepared a five minute intervention during which they will be covering the role that sustainable energy currently play in the context of the post COVID recovery in their respective countries and region. So what are the key elements for the energy transition in the country or region and what is needed for the international community to fast track the energy transition? Transformation and what role can IRENA play to assist in achieving the 2030 agenda and build back track? So please, Michael, you have uh, the floor. Uh, thank you very much, Safieta, and thank you for those kind words. Uh, talking about me. Um, first is to uh, re-emphasize which other speakers have said that uh, there is very huge potential for renewable energy in Africa. And this huge potential can actually serve a very big purpose for which uh, uh, we can be uh, participants. And also to thank IRENA for supporting Uganda in the NDC alignment, because right now we are having the support from IRENA to align our NDC uh, uh, objectives. Now, going back to how can we prepare for the transition as a country, uh, one is to mention that uh, we will need useful data as maybe a country, but also as a, a continent. We need useful data in two ways. One would be quality data, uh, data that speaks uh, the truth, but also two, we need harmonized data. When you look uh, across the region, uh, we are using different tools to gather data. And uh, when we go for comparison of this data, sometimes we get wrong conclusions. So uh, I had highlighted this sometime back that we we'll need to work out a harmonized methodology of data collection, which speaks across both, and then will give us harmonized data so that uh, finally we can make very good comparison across both. Uh, also, we uh, would need capacity building uh, in the form of renewable energy technologies. We have noted in some technologies we don't have uh, Masons, uh, we did a study for small scale hydro systems, which uh, would work very well in remote areas, but we don't have um, uh, people who would do operation and maintenance. So it would be an opportunity in the transition that we build such capacities for the different technologies for maintaining these uh, systems, but also uh, building capacity for consultants. Uh, we usually depend on uh, international consultants. I think it is high time now that we broaden the scope and build as much momentum as possible in terms of consultancies and the capacities to handle such uh, uh, complex consultancies. Now, as uh, all colleagues may note, we have uh, limited financing for renewable energy. What we have had in, in energy is for uh, fossil fuel investment. But now towards the transition, I think we should allocate much more than what is being allocated now. And I think this can come uh, if the political leadership across the continent uh, agrees that uh, there is more to do with renewable energy. And then we allocate more financing renewable energy. But also within the renewable energy space, we need the uh, equitable distribution and equitable opportunities for financing for the different renewable energy technologies. 
uh, we sometimes tend to concentrate on a few technologies in renewable energy and forget about others. But when you look on uh, the African continent, I think we have a broad range, almost all the ranges for renewable energy, including biomass by the Biomass is the biggest resource which we have on the continent, but which is uh, least funded. And whenever it is uh, put on the table, it is uh, considered last. I think it is the now the opportunity to see how can we fund uh, biomass energy, not, not to promote it per se, but to harvest it sustainably and also make it available. Because when you look on the continent, and you see the majority, more than 50% of the people depending on biomass, I think it speaks a lot that even if we wanted to institute new technologies, and if we ignore biomass, we would not go very far. So we need to look at it in that way. Uh, but also to emphasize that we need local solutions based on local experiences, uh, maybe, and an example is, is that of the biomass, which I had just given, that if everybody in the community is uh, utilizing biomass, but we are bringing in soda, which uh, is a new technology to the community, is, is there a possibility that we can devise means of utilizing the available resource for which everybody is comfortable in at that particular time as we transition slowly? Uh, Another thing which we need to note is that uh, most of the renewable energy technologies on the African continent, technologies, resources, and processes do not have standards. And therefore, we need to work on these standards, put them in place, so that when we are doing a process, when we are having a product, or when we are having the resource, we have a standard that we are following. Uh, of course, I would need to highlight that the policies might, uh, might have to reflect that we are transitioning. In Uganda, we've already started the discussion of transition, uh, but we have not changed the policies per se to, to mention that there is a transition. So it has to come out uh, very clearly that the politicians start talking about transition and not only the technical people. And uh, maybe another thing I would want to highlight is uh, when we are doing uh, project support, which I see happening a lot, is that uh, we start a project, but when we are reaching the conclusion, we are talking a different language. I have seen most of the projects in Africa or maybe in Uganda, we have used the justification that we are highly dependent on biomass to introduce other forms of energy or renewable energy for that case. But finally, when we reach the implementation phase, we are not implementing anything to substitute biomass, but something maybe for increased industrialization. So we need to see the justification rhyming with finally the uh, implementation objectives. I thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Michael, for your intervention. Uh, I've been informed that um, Mr. Herman from uh, Denmark is now with us. So please, uh, the floor is yours, uh, sir, for your intervention. No, thank you so much, uh, moderator, and my apologies for, uh, for, for joining late, uh, having technical difficulties. It seems that even more than a year after we've gone sort of totally virtual, I'm still struggling with, uh, with the technique. But, but thank you so much for the opportunity to participate in today's uh, discussion on how renewable energy can, can help create a green pathway to recovery in sub-Saharan Africa. And Denmark is very, very proud to co-sponsor this with, with, amongst others, our good friends from, from Irina. We firmly believe that renewable energy not only can, but should play a transformative role as an enabler of sustainable development and economic growth. Because expanding access to clean energy is, is critical to our efforts to recover uh, from the pandemic. As we know all too well, I mean, almost 550 million people in Sub-Saharan Africa do not have access to, uh, to energy. And expanding uh, the access to energy is not only important in itself, 
but, but because energy access has wide ranging impacts on improving health, on education, on gender equality and economic growth, energy is an enabler uh, for, for development uh, and, and, and prosperity. So while access to energy uh, with good reason is a high priority and prerequisite for development, efforts to provide it uh, must not compromise uh, our obligations and our interest in protecting the climate. There is no dichotomy between efforts to provide energy access and efforts to combat climate change. And it's imperative that we address them holistically. Now, Denmark recently launched its, its new development cooperation strategy. I'm very, very happy to, to share with you that the green energy transition in Africa plays an absolutely central role in this uh, strategy. A new strategy that aims to elevate both public and private investments and to make renewable energy the most feasible investment target when choosing uh, between black and green. Uh, through it, its support to access to clean energy, Denmark will try to contribute to job creation, to empowering women and to improving health, to ensure that efforts come to the advantages of whole society. Uh, clean energy, sustainable energy is not, is not just a sector, it is an approach uh, to develop and it is an approach to climate change. So alongside our efforts to scale up renewable energy, climate adaptation uh, form another central pillar of the new strategy. Because while we strive to mitigate the impact of climate change and catalyze sustainable development by scaling up clean energy solutions, we cannot close our eyes to, to the impacts already present. Therefore, Denmark is, is committed to strengthening uh, our climate adaptation efforts and to integrate these into mitigation and renewable energy initiatives. For example, by developing solar-driven water pumps in humanitarian operations. Because only by applying a, what you might call sort of a balanced approach where mitigation and adaptation goes hand in hand, then we can ensure that we leave no one behind in our fight, uh, not only against poverty, but also in our fight against uh, climate change. So in conclusion, I think we have a joint responsibility to support uh, the African continent to support our African partners, brothers and sisters, to make full use of this substantial renewable energy uh, potential and resources that are on the continent. If we get it right now, we have an opportunity not only to save lives, but actually to empower people uh, uh, with, uh, uh, with, with the potential, with the tools to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to find a path towards uh, prosperity and, uh, and development, uh, and, and to help people lift themselves out of energy poverty, uh, but also to stop off uh, climate change and to put us on a Paris aligned uh, pathway. I think it's fantastic to see such an excellent set of speakers here today. And I really look forward to hear your perspectives on, on actions uh, needed, because I think that's what we need. We need, uh, as uh, Elvis once put, we need a little less talking and a lot more uh, action. And, and that's the approach that Arena is taking, and we're delighted to be uh, part of you. So thank you once again for, for having me here today. And once again, uh, Saviatu, my apologies for, uh, for, for logging on late and my technical uh, inability to, uh, to master Zoom. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh... Excellent, Senator Herman, for your statement and for your very inspiring address. So coming back to the panel now, I would like to call upon the next panelist who is Mr. Suleiman Konate. He's the Secretary General at the Ministry of Mines, Carries and the Energy of Burkina Faso. So Mr. Konate has been appointed at this position in March 2021. Prior to this, prior to this appointment, Mr. Konate was the technical advisor at the Ministry of Energy. In that capacity, he actively participated in the development, planning, coordination, management, monitoring, and implementation of projects and uh, programs in the energy sector. He also contributed to the writing of the vision and the plans and objective of development of energy sector. He also has several scientific and uh, professional experience at uh, UPS Toulouse in France. So, uh, la parole est à vous, Monsieur Konati. Ok, bonjour, merci bien, madame. Donc, je suis Nongnoré Kipsei Saka, je représente euh, M. Konate Suleiman, qui est empêché en dernière minute, qui m'a demandé donc de le représenter. Actuellement, je suis le directeur général en charge des énergies renouvelables au ministère de l'Énergie. Donc, si vous permettez, donc, euh, dans le cadre donc, de ce panel, donc, il faut dire que le secteur de l'énergie, notamment de notre Burkina Faso, donc, a été fortement impacté donc, avec l'avènement du COVID-19. À cet égard, donc, euh, comme le disait le, monsieur le directeur général, monsieur Francesco, la caméra, 
Les énergies renouvelables sont essentielles donc, pour la réalisation donc, de l'objectif de développement durable, notamment le point 7, et la mise en place d'économies résilientes et équitables durables dans le monde de l'après-COVID-19. En effet, la COVID-19 associée donc à la crise donc sécuritaire que traverse notre pays a accentué le fossé donc qu'il y a entre les franges donc les plus défavorisées de la société nationale et les classes moyennes en matière d'accès à l'énergie et des progrès doivent être faits pour garantir l'accès de tous à une énergie fiable, durable, moderne et à prix abordable. Aussi, il faut dire que les énergies renouvelables constituent donc une alternative de choix pour la transition donc énergétique. Ce qui nécessite donc les gens donc de développer vraiment des solutions énergétiques durables pour notre pays, également assurer donc la vulgarisation de sources de production beaucoup plus efficient pour pouvoir donc assurer donc l'approvisionnement durable en énergie. Donc en termes donc d'éléments de transition clé pour notre pays, il faut dire que nous sommes donc en train donc de revoir le master plan, donc le schéma directeur donc de, du secteur de l'électricité, qui va garantir un peu donc les différentes sources options donc de production pour garantir un accès durable et universel au truc. Également, donc, mettre l'accès un peu plus sur les bioénergies, comme l'a souligné donc, notre collègue donc, de l'Ouganda. Il faut dire qu'ici, en termes de bioénergie, il y a au-delà de la diffusion des foyers améliorés et d'autres euh, sources donc, de substitution du bois et du charbon de bois. Il faut parler donc, beaucoup plus donc, des biodigesteurs qui connaissent déjà un grand pas donc, au Burkina Faso, mais qui nécessitent en tout cas l'accompagnement des partenaires techniques et financiers qui permet donc à la population rurale donc d'avoir accès donc à la cuisson propre, à l'éclairage et également donc des substances donc de digestion donc pour améliorer donc la productivité agricole. Donc en termes donc d'éléments clés pour notre transition énergétique, il faut dire que dans le chemin directeur on met l'accent beaucoup plus sur deux axes. Il y a donc la planification pour les pour le système électrique existant. Et leur extension, mais également une planification dédiée donc à des zones rurales isolées. Et dans ce cadre, donc, nous avons la diffusion donc de technologies telles que les solar home systems ou des systèmes donc de pompage et choses pour les activités génératrices de revenus. Mais également donc dans, dans la phase donc Covid, nous avons expérimenté également donc l'accompagnement des différents ménages compte tenu donc des mesures qui étaient prises. Donc en, en dotant beaucoup de près de plus de 5000 ménages donc un kit solaire donc, euh, domestique qui a permis en tout cas un ressenti, un boom, si je peux dire, donc, dans l'accès aux services énergétiques, notamment en milieu rural et même urbain, donc dans les zones périphériques. Donc il faut dire que l'intégration de ces énergies rurales s'est également donc, accentuée donc, dans les différents services, notamment donc, pour les services de santé tels que l'IRENA nous accompagne donc, pour, la, pour une meilleure structuration, mais également donc, dans les centres éducatifs pour pouvoir assurer donc la qualité donc de l'enseignement mais également garantir un accès équitable dans nos centres de santé. Donc il faut dire que pour euh, le soutien qui est beaucoup plus attendu donc de la communauté internationale, ça nous, nous accompagne à développer donc euh, le système électrique national. Il faut dire que souvent on a besoin parce que quand on regarde on dit non en Afrique on a très peu donc de capacité de, notamment en énergie solaire ou renouvelable. Il faut dire que le secteur de l'énergie est un secteur donc euh, beaucoup plus euh, lié, tel qu'on ne peut pas renforcer assez de la production tant qu'on n'a pas le réseau de transport assez solide pour pouvoir donc euh, transporter l'énergie et la distribuer donc euh, au niveau donc, des consommateurs. Donc il faut dire que ce appui, donc au-delà de les unités de production, il faudra aussi soutenir les États pour le développement donc des différents réseaux. Également donc euh, nous avons besoin donc du secteur privé. Il faut dire que pour atteindre les objectifs d'accès universel, le privé a un grand rôle à jouer. Et dans ce cadre, donc, je pense qu'avec les partenaires techniques et financiers, doivent alléger donc, les mécanismes d'accès à l'aide du chez privé, surtout pour nos acteurs nationaux africains, mais également donc, les acteurs internationaux, pour pouvoir donc, accompagner donc, nos différents États donc, dans l'accès aux services énergétiques dans le plus bref délai, parce que l'origine 2030 
notre part, nous sommes en moins de 10 ans, et que vraiment une meilleure restructuration donc, de ces guichets privés pourra donc faciliter donc, la fin des objectifs. Mais également à l'IRENA, en tout cas, merci déjà pour l'appui constant que vous apportez à notre nation. Mais également, il faut dire que votre soutien reste toujours désiré, notamment dans la formulation et la mise en œuvre des CDN qui sont en cours d'élaboration et qui constituent des moyens forts pour la mobilisation des fonds vers le climat. Et en tout cas, nous saluons déjà les efforts qui sont faits et la collaboration. Et également, donc, je pense que nous sommes disponibles pour tout autre engagement donc, que nous serons sollicités donc, à mettre en œuvre. Merci bien, madame. Merci beaucoup, monsieur Nongnogo, pour votre brillante intervention qui a donné assez de clarté sur le secteur des énergies au Burkina et aussi les des actions qui sont attendues de la communauté internationale. It's now my pleasure to call upon Dr. Gloria Magombo for her intervention. So Dr. Gloria Magombo, she's the permanent secretary at the Ministry of Energy and uh, Power Development in uh, Zimbabwe. She has a career which spans over 29 years. She has a vast experience and expertise, including uh, policy formulation, strategy development and uh, implementation. Prior to her appointment as Permanent Secretary for Energy and the Power Development in the government of uh, Zimbabwe, she served as in numerous positions, including CEO of the Zimbabwe Energy Regulatory Authority and the Regional Chairperson for Regional Electricity Regulators and uh, as, uh, Regulators Association, RERA, amongst others. So the floor is yours, uh, Mrs. Uh, Magongo. Thank you, Safi. Um, I would like to recognize you as our moderator. It's a pleasure uh, meeting you again this time. I would also like to acknowledge the Director General and all the excellencies and interventions which have come before me coming in. Uh, it is indeed a, a good day to you all and a pleasure for me to share some of the experiences which we have had at a national level and also at regional level with regards to how COVID-19 has affected us um, in terms of service provision. And especially when we are looking at building back better and ensuring that no one is left behind. COVID has shown the need for equitable um, access, uh, especially to modern energy, because when most countries went into shutdown, there was movement, especially for most schools to online learning and in areas where there was no access, the gap was felt even much, um, uh, uh, much more because most of the students could not attend school because of lack of online, uh, which was driven by lack of access to modern energy. As a country, uh, Zimbabwe, we have achieved about 44% access to electricity, uh, which we also use uh, interchangeable with access to modern energy, which then leaves the 56% mainly in rural communities who are then having to um, deal without access to energy. And there are various strategies which we have uh, adopted at a national level. I think the first issue is that we have a vision to achieve a prosperous and empowered middle income economy society by 2030. And to that effect, we have gone on to adopt uh, uh, the uh, goal number seven within the energy sector to ensure that we have universal access to sustainable and modern energy by 2030. And we have various um, outcomes which we look forward to as part of the national development strategy, which we have just launched um, starting from 2021 to 2025. And that's increased um, moving on to uh, improved energy supply capacity and then uh, improved access and moving towards the universal access and then the improved energy efficiency. Because we believe that for us to accelerate the access to modern energy, there is need to look at renewable energy as the key driver. 
and we have developed a rural energy master plan, which is looking at um, about 60% of the access being driven by grid extension, but we have the other 40%, which will have to come from creation of mini grids, macro grids, which will be mainly driven by end user infrastructure, which will create um, a lot of industries within the rural communities. And uh, we have, as a country, since launched the, the renewable energy policy, um, which comes with various incentives. And we have seen the need for private sector to participate in this space. And we are working uh, with the African Development Bank to come up with a procurement framework which will allow us to procure new capacity using a framework uh, for competitive, uh, co competitive uh, framework. We are also learning from the open source um, documents which IRENA has put up to also look at how best we can adapt some of those documents to our procurement framework, which we are working on. And I would also want to highlight the fact that um, whilst this um, 54, 56% of unsaved people for us, it creates an opportunity for new investments and also for us to leapfrog and adopt the new technologies much faster because we will not have the challenge of any stranded infrastructure. So we are happy to partner with various uh, stakeholders to ensure that uh, we are able to create a pipeline of projects which can then be procured over the next three years for us to then increase the renewable uh, energy from the current um, the contribution um, of about um, 116 megawatts, which is uh, 75 megawatts coming from biogas, uh, mainly as a byproduct produced by our um, uh, sugar production companies in, in, in form of uh, bagas. We also have about 31 megawatts coming from mini hydros and about plus or minus 10 to 15 megawatts coming from solar. With the amount of energy resources which we have in terms of solar, we believe that we can increase the contribution to solar to about 1,000 uh, megawatts by 2025, and hence the need for us to do this competitive procurement where we have already identified suitable sites and projects which uh, contribute to about 500 megawatts already. I would like to also weigh in on the issue of uh, clean cooking, that whilst we are saying we have these 50%, um, 56% uh, which don't have access, we will have much higher percentage which don't have access to clean cooking. And as a country, we have been working uh, quite um, hard to increase the adoption of other forms of uh, clean cooking in the form of biogas, where we have been doing a lot of work in terms of trying training uh, masons who can build biogas uh, digesters, and also clean cook uh, cook stoves, especially those which use less wood and are more efficient. And we also have tried to increase the adoption of LPG for rural communities. But we have seen that for rural communities, what works best is use of biogas, which is really using their waste and it becomes much more sustainable. And to that effect, we are really wishing to get um, partners, some who might be participating now, to collaborate and work with us to ensure that we can come up with a clean cooking program, which will be able to attract funding uh, for this sector. We have not been able to attract funding and we are working and hoping that um, under the clean energy, uh, clean climate funds, we can have access to such um, funding. And we as a country have also um, worked on biofuels as one of the key sources of energy 
And to this effect, we launched a biofuels policy in 2019, but we are also uh, blending our fuel at about 20% uh, of ethanol as part of us greening up our economy. And we are working on getting partners to work with us to develop a biodiesel plant. And we are still appealing for partners in that area. We have um, been applying to various funds using some of the opportunities which uh, IRENA has uh, given us to, to, to get partners to develop the biofuels, especially on the biodiesel side using Jatropha as a feedstock. In terms of embracing the transition as a country, our policy position has been made clear that we are moving towards clean and renewable energy. And we do have projects which are already under consideration. Whilst we are building, I would like to acknowledge that we are one of the few countries which are still building about 600 megawatts of uh, coal uh, because of the resources we have and also the need for us to get baseload. We are also working on improving our infrastructure, which is the transmission and distribution infrastructure to allow for better flexibility so that we can bring in more renewables in the sector. We do have 60% of our energy currently coming from our large hydro, which is Kariba, but it has been prone to serious droughts, which has made it very difficult for us to sustain the power generation from this. We are also developing a joint project between ourselves and Zambia in the form of Batoka, Batoka power project, which will give us an additional 2,400 megawatts of hydropower on the Zambezi Valley. So I would like to really say that as a country, we are ready to move forward and increase the um, access to energy, special modern energy in our unsaved communities using renewable energy. What we are looking for is partners who can come in and assist us, especially with funding. We have now mobilized a lot of local funds through our insurance companies, which are then assisting us to also build some of the projects which are under construction. We have almost about 50 megawatts of solar plants, which we expect to bring online over this uh, next six months or so, which are already under construction. We are really looking forward to the climate investment forums. I think as a country, we had even offered to host such forums, especially for the Southern African region to ensure that um, together as Southern Africa, we already have an existing and operating pool, which does provide for a larger market access for those who want to come and invest in renewable energy within the Southern African pool and also in particular within Zimbabwe. So uh, moderator, I would really like to appreciate the role that uh, IRENA has played in Zimbabwe, especially given that we are part of those countries which they are working with to ensure that we review our NDCs uh, preparation. And um, they also helped us to come up with our various uh, renewable maps through the African energy um, corridor. And we are really looking forward to some of the other initiatives and also the finalization of our readiness assessment, which was started but somehow stalled somewhere along the line. I'm still pursuing that so that we can be clear in terms of where our gaps are in terms of policy and what are the initiatives we need to put in place to ensure that we attract the relevant uh, investments into our country. Thank you so much for allowing us to contribute. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Magombo, for your very clear presentation of the energy sector in Zimbabwe, including the activities or let's say the actions you will want to really uh, follow for the next, the future of uh, the, the development of uh, that sector. One thing really caught my attention is that I think uh, in her intervention, uh, Dr. Uh, Her Excellency Dr. Nawal was talking about the right mindset. And you just mentioned something, Dr. Magombo, which I think all African countries should have in mind. Using our access challenge 
us an opportunity to leapfrog towards new technology. I think all of us, we should really think like that. So thank you once again, thank you very much. So I would like now to invite uh, our next speaker, who is uh, Mr. Rodrigo uh, Catros Macansa. He is the deputy director for new and renewable energy at the Ministry of Energy and uh, Hydraulic Resources of Gabon. Uh, la parole est à vous, Monsieur Macansa. Bonjour tout le monde. Merci Madame Siafiatou de m'avoir donné la parole. Je suis très honoré de participer à ce panel pour vous parler de, du secteur de l'énergie du Gabon dans la période COVID. Merci encore. Je suis M. Mankassan Gouvili Rodrigue, Katos, directeur adjoint des énergies nouvelles et renouvelables, point focal Irena Gavon et point focal ARI, l'initiative africaine des énergies renouvelables. Merci encore. Il faut dire que la chute des cours du pétrole, accompagnée de la crise sanitaire liée à la pandémie de la COVID, a mis en mal la croissance socio-économique au Gabon. Face à cette situation, et dans le souci de rester sur la trajectoire de l'émergence, le Gabon entend diversifier son économie en promouvant le développement de nouveaux secteurs, en accroissant l'implication du secteur privé dans les actions de développement et en améliorant les conditions et moyens d'existence des populations. Pour donner corps à cette nouvelle vision, le pays doit mettre à la disposition des acteurs économiques une énergie de qualité disponible et accessible à tous, à moins de coûts et respectueuse de l'environnement. Cette vision s'articule à celle du plan stratégique Gabon émergent, cadre de référence des politiques publiques qui positionne le secteur de l'énergie comme un soutien majeur au développement de l'économie. Le Gabon, il faut le dire, dispose d'un potentiel énorme pour promouvoir les énergies renouvelables. C'est pour cela que la transition énergétique du Gabon consiste à passer d'une production d'électricité dominée par les combustibles fossiles à un mix composé d'énergie renouvelable, dont 80% d'origine hydroélectrique. Sachant que le potentiel hydroélectrique du Gabon est évalué à 11 000 MW. L'hydroélectricité dans le mix de production fournit actuellement 42 des besoins du Gabon en énergie électrique. Pour atteindre cet objectif, donc de 80 des parts des énergies renouvelables dans le mix actuel de l'énergie, la stratégie du Gabon se décline en cinq principaux axes d'intervention prioritaires en réponse aux défis majeurs identifiés, à savoir l'accroissement de la part des énergies renouvelables dans l'offre énergétique du pays. Un certain nombre d'actions vont donc nous permettre d'atteindre cet objectif. C'est d'une part, il faut intensifier dans la production, intensifier la production des énergies renouvelables dans les réseaux interconnectés, ainsi que les systèmes isolés, donc les systèmes hors réseau. Il faut promouvoir la bioénergie en mettant un accent particulier sur la biomasse pour la production d'électricité. Le deuxième axe, c'est le développement de la maîtrise et de l'efficacité énergétique. Le troisième axe, 
c'est l'accès durable des populations aux combustibles modernes de cuisson par l'utilisation des technologies efficaces et innovantes. Le quatrième axe, c'est la promotion de la recherche sur les énergies renouvelables et la vulgarisation des résultats. Enfin, le cinquième axe va concerner le renforcement du financement, de la gouvernance, de la régulation et du suivi et évaluation du secteur des énergies renouvelables. Pour accélérer la promotion des énergies renouvelables, il est fortement recommandé d'instaurer un environnement favorable régi par un cadre législatif et administratif cohérent. C'est pourquoi, en ce qui concerne la gouvernance de, du secteur, le Gabon s'est fait accompagner par la Banque mondiale à travers donc le, un appui financier de cette institution nous avons pu financer le plan, le schéma directeur euh, électrification et hydraulique rurale. Nous avons pu financer le plan euh, directeur production, transport et distribution de l'énergie électrique au Gabon. Et nous avons aussi pu financer le code de l'électricité. Aussi, il faut dire aussi, euh, 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 en ce qui concerne donc euh, la promotion des, des énergies renouvelables, euh, il faut faciliter l'accès au financement. Et euh, décliner une vision claire et d'élaborer un plan d'action stratégique avec un portefeuille des, des projets. Donc, nous avons un ensemble de portefeuilles de projets que je ne peux pas, vu le temps qui m'est imparti, que je ne peux pas décliner ici. On a un portefeuille de projets euh, que peut-être nous allons, dans les jours euh, à venir, soumettre euh, à l'IRENA. Euh, en ce qui concerne le rôle de, que l'IRENA peut jouer pour aider à réaliser l'agenda 2030. Euh, il faut dire que le Gabon est membre de l'IRENA depuis euh, 2013. À ce titre, le Gabon bénéficie actuellement d'un appui euh, technique de la part de, de l'IRENA. L'IRENA nous a appuyé dans le renforcement des capacités techniques en planification et modélisation énergétique. L'IRENA nous appuie aussi dans la révision de la CDN et dans le cadre de l'intégration de la, la, la sous-régionale de la, la CEMAC, l'IRENA a soutenu, euh, a accordé un appui technique et financier à l'élaboration de la feuille de route pour la promotion des énergies nouvelles et renouvelables en Afrique centrale. Donc, l'IRENA, euh, à travers donc, sa plaque euh, forme des investissements climatiques, l'IRENA doit appuyer le pays à développer les projets des énergies renouvelables. Et l'IRENA aussi doit permettre à mettre en relation les porteurs de projets et les produits financiers. Je vous remercie. Merci beaucoup, M. Mankassa, pour votre brillante intervention qui nous a vraiment donné une image assez précise sur le secteur des énergies renouvelables à, à, au Gabon. So, last but not least. Merci, madame. The last speaker is uh, Mr. Hassianto Elayo from uh, ECRE. He's a sustainable energy policy officer at ECRE. He's responsible for uh, ECRE's sustainable energy policy program, which aims at the development of uh, appropriate regional and national policy frameworks and an enabling environment to promote sustainable energy investment in the ECOWAS member states. 
He coordinated the development of the regional sustainable energy policies, which were adopted by the authority of ECOWAS heads of state in 2013. So please, Mr. Hacinto Elayo, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, thank you, Safiya. It's uh, always a pleasure to, to see you and to be with you and the Irina uh, family. I would like to first start by uh, thanking uh, Irina for inviting us to this very important uh, uh, forum. I bring you greetings uh, from the Echo Center for Renewable Energy Efficiency and from the West Africa uh, region. Uh, over the years, obviously, we worked closely with Irina and we collaborated on several initiatives to see how we can uh, bring about uh, concrete development as far as the civilian sector in West Africa uh, is concerned. As you already noted, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has uh, imposed uh, really great uh, negative social, economic, and financial and human security impacts on ECOWAS member states. Uh, it's not only a global health challenge, but it's also posed uh, uh, challenges to our regional integration efforts, uh, regional peace and security, and also sustainable development of, of, uh, of our countries. Uh, and therefore, providing a commercial level of uh, response and recovery to address these uh, issues has been of uh, a priority to our, uh, our, our governments and, and member states. And uh, see that we can, we can subsidize the uh, multifaceted uh, consequences of the pandemic on vulnerable communities and our countries. Uh, when you talk about uh, clean energy technologies, definitely, uh, this has a, a serious role and uh, to, to play in terms of how we can increase the resilience of the health and social uh, sectors uh, while supporting local private sector companies involved in the uh, in the social energy markets. Uh, CETs can also strengthen the social community resilience of vulnerable communities, and uh, we're trying to see how we can support initiatives in the productive use of energy and also in high high impact uh, value chains. Uh, at the height of the pandemic, uh, ECRI uh, uh, initiated the uh, RECOVID. Uh, it's basically a facility that supports uh, member states in terms of recovery. And uh, currently, we're supporting a few countries in terms of uh, providing grants, uh, co-funding, to electrify and power healthcare systems uh, in the provision of, cl of clean cook stoves to vulnerable communities. Uh, there's definitely a great potential uh, to provide affordable energy and water to energy technologies in the agricultural sector, uh, using, using the slow pumping to, for irrigation uh, and the like. And uh, when you talk about um, uh, the statistics, I saw the concept note from Irina that despite the gigawatts has been uh, installed over the years, uh, West Africa, Africa as a continent still, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa still uh, gets a very uh, minute share uh, of that. There's uh, really a need, and as my colleague from Burkina Faso uh, rightly noted, there's a need for us to support member states in terms of access to consumer financing so that they can complete uh, priority transfer and distribution projects. Uh, because if you want to uh, you know, foster an environment for IPPs, we have to make sure that the power that's generated are, are able to be, can be evacuated to the demand centers. That way we can make PPAs bankable, we can attract more IPPs, and we can, in so doing, also reduce the commercial losses of our utilities and, and uh, off-takers. We've worked over the years, as you already noted uh, in, your, in your opening presentation, Irina. Uh, we've worked with uh, Irina in terms of the WACEC initiative, and uh, there's a need for us to actively uh, move forward now towards uh, uh, large-scale uh, tenders, how we can de-risk last key with projects, and I look forward to working uh, closely with Irina and other partners so we can get that forward. Uh, in terms of the um, uh, decentralized systems, obviously we know that uh, there will be large populations and communities that are so isolated, they have no chance, no hope of being uh, connected to the grid anytime soon. So in that case, uh, mini grids, slow home systems have a huge role, role to play in that regard. I'm trying to see how we can de-risk uh, some of these transact these uh, projects, how we can make them uh, attractive for private sector folks to participate in the space. Uh, so the role of public funds to leverage, to de-risk, to make them attractive is important. 
uh, in terms of uh, identifying demand centers, who are the off takers in there. We see the irony that sometimes the, uh, the rural communities spend much more on, on energy or electricity than even folks in the, in the urban areas. So there's really is a need for us to identify those uh, demand centers and so we can target resources uh, towards those guys. Uh, there's also opportunity, uh, obviously, for uh, commercial and industrial applications. And there's a need, for, there's a, we, we see a huge opportunity also uh, for us to provide uh, solar generation systems and, and storage uh, for commercial, commercial businesses, industrial companies, academic institutions, hospitals, nonprofits, and the like. And uh, we've seen from reports also that uh, countries are spending, I mean, billions of dollars really on self generation. So that actually shows that there's really a potential right there. And if you're able to, uh, to tap into that and make sure that we, we, we provide energy and electricity that is clean, that's affordable and reliable, definitely there's a, there's, there's a, there are off takers right there that can, that can tap into it. Uh, one also very important uh, aspect I'd like to just uh, note also is that we, ha we have to see how we can support uh, technology companies that serve as clean, clean tech aggre 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 aggregators of decentralized energy as a service solution and as a form of providing digital payments and data for fintech companies. That linkage, I think, is also uh, has a huge potential uh, for what, what we're saying. As I excellency noted, finance is key. You know, we've been involved in this sector, all of us, for decades now. Uh, the, the statistics have not changed. You know, less than half of African people have no access to data, energy, uh, energy poverty, energy deficits. We've been in, we have been in, in several kinds of panels, <laughs> SFs, and uh, all kinds <laughs> of cases. The data is not, uh, hasn't changed much, which means that uh, either we're not, um, we're, we're only scratching the surface. So I think it's important, and as the uh, colleague from the EU noted, how we can target uh, public finance to leverage uh, private sector financing into the sector. The role of a uh, local private sector and the need for us to support them to access financing. You know, the guys who are actually on the ground trying to make a difference, trying to uh, deploy uh, clean energy technologies and services to communities, to businesses. Those guys should be supported with targeted uh, financing, credit lines, and the like. So I think the next decade is really critical for, uh, for us as a global community, for Africa. Uh, as you already noted, we've been involved in this uh, effort now. We've developed uh, action plans, uh, policies, uh, I will say, and targets that, that the region, the West African region must meet by 2020. Obviously, we've, uh, we've, we've fallen short of the 2020 targets. We have an opportunity in the next decade to make a difference uh, by 2030. In line with the Paris Agreement, in line with SDG 7, there's a need for global communities to show strong solidarity. Africa is, has great opportunity. The resources are here. We have an opportunity to, to make the, the biggest difference in terms of energy transition, you know, to leapfrog from polluting fuels and ensure that our energy systems or access uh, initiatives are really anchored on clean and sustainable energy technologies and services. Uh, and I'm looking to see how we can you know, de-risk uh, such transactions. And I'm really happy about the climate diversity forums that Irina is working on. Uh, we've worked, as you know, on action plans for member states to see how they can uh, contribute to regional targets. And we've received requests from member states to see how we can uh, organize partner uh, roundtables to look at the projects have been, have, have been identified and how we can facilitate and, and execute that. So um, in a nutshell, we're looking forward to really working uh, with ARENA, with member states, with uh, partners, and with, the, uh, with financial institutions uh, to see how, and, and, and private, private, private finance, to see how we can really mobilize uh, financing for these critical uh, projects and uh, initiatives across the region. And I think, if, I think if, if we do that, you know, really there's, uh, there's really a potential and opportunity for us to make uh, energy access, universal access, a, a reality by 2030. 
So I'll stop here with my opening remarks and I'm looking forward to a very ro robust uh, conversation and discussion uh, going forward. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Elayu, for your uh, intervention. Indeed, you guys at ECRI are doing a very good job and uh, your support to the development of the renewable energy and energy efficiency sector in West Africa is just outstanding. I know that in many regions, you are uh, being seen as a model to follow. Thank you very much. So ladies and gentlemen, distinguished uh, participants, we are now at the end of our uh, panel discussion. So I've highlighted a few key takeaways. Uh, most of the participants, they have highlighted the need to support the development of power system, particularly the grid system, in order to accommodate enough renewable energy power to make the transition effective. Another thing that came up is the support to the private sector. So how to support the private sector to tap into the existing funding mechanism, including also innovative ones in order to develop local industry. The third one is the support in formulating and implementing the NDCs. I think that one Irina is already working with the countries.
apologies. It seems that uh, Safi is having some technical problems. Uh, so we waited for a few minutes. Uh, we don't see her back. So on behalf of uh, Irina, we wanted to thank uh, all the panelists for uh, uh, these excellent perspectives from our member countries. And we have uh, noted some of these uh, key uh, themes which are coming through, like uh, Safi highlighted. There is clearly a need for Irina to work together with our partners on uh, finance facilitation and also continue support for uh, NDCs, which we'll continue to do. We'll also try and uh, organize these physical events uh, in the region, uh, assuming that the, the current situation abates. So I think uh, from the discussions that we have had, there is a very clear roadmap ahead for uh, the member countries and Irene as a partner to uh, accelerate renewable energy ambition in the, the continent in the coming days. So we want to take this opportunity to thank all the panelists. We also want to thank uh, uh, Denmark and the UAE for sponsoring this event. And also uh, thank the European Union uh, Commission for joining this event. So thank you all very much and uh, uh, wish you all a great day ahead or a, a nice evening. Thank you.